In this video, I want to talk about what for me is actually one of the most exciting, compelling things that Ray can do. So if you're not familiar with Ray, this video is part of a larger playlist on just an introduction to the Ray framework. I'll put a link, a little card up here. In this video, I want to talk about the Ray Serve API, which kind of does what no other framework, at least out there right now, does or does easily. And that's serve and productionize machine learning models. So most of the machine learning frameworks out there really focus on the process of training a model, doing things like tuning a model, preparing data to then pass to a model, but none of them really are addressing the problem of how do we give predictions once we've trained a model? With the exception of some frameworks have specific APIs or kind of third-party extensions built on, like the TensorFlow Serving API. But with TensorFlow Serving, it's really, this is how you serve a TensorFlow model. It's not, this is how you serve any sort of model, regardless of which framework the model was trained in. And that's where Ray Serve really comes in. It's basically a framework agnostic, general, almost feels more like a web framework for serving and scaling machine learning model predictions. So if you're not familiar with kind of the full life cycle of machine learning kind of start to finish or kind of the data science process, and especially if you haven't done this at a company or kind of a company at scale where they have this machine learning API or they have a machine learning service that they use in their internal product or that they use in their web application, you don't really ever encounter this. And this video, I want to talk both about how kind of machine learning in practice in production works and additionally, how RayServe really simplifies things. So this is kind of my abstraction of the data science and kind of machine learning process, if you will. Again, I'm not saying I'm the definitive expert on how to organize or categorize these things, but typically you start off with some raw data. In this diagram here, we have our raw data. We're doing some sort of data scrubbing, data munging. We get cleaned data, but then we also have to prepare that clean data to make it suitable for machine learning models or, or training. So we typically vectorize it in the sense of turning raw data, whether it's text or images, into something like numbers in a, in a matrix. Once we have numerical data, we typically want to do some sort of split into a training set and a test set so we can do evaluation, we can do cross-validation to kind of tune our model and make sure it's performing as well as we want it to. Once we have a evaluated and tuned model, the bits at the bottom here in red are really kind of the production pipeline. So they have something of a mirror to the training pipeline. You have some new data that's coming in. Maybe it's from a web application. Maybe it's from some users or an app on their phone. Now, if you've trained the model with some sort of scrubbed and vectorized data, you need to make sure that when you are doing this in production, if you are giving predictions, you need to scrub that new data and vectorize that new data in the same way that you did when you were training your model. And with that, you have this prepared data, you combine it with your model to get a prediction, and that could be in the form of some, some label or class. And this bottom pipeline here is really deploying machine learning models kind of in an abstract sense. If you do wanna deploy a trained and prepared machine learning model, you'll probably go through something like this. But what no other framework really helps you with is, is this yellow box here. And typically people code up their own web application or service in something like Flask or some other web application framework. But this is really where, where RayServe is gonna come and, and help us. Now let's say we have some hypothetical web application and this is where our raw data comes from. This is, let's imagine we're YouTube. This is people watching videos, liking videos, disliking videos, commenting. We have this stream of events based on our users. So again, these are comments, likes, maybe even just uploading videos. And with these, if we have the machine learning at YouTube that's giving these recommendations, we're probably gonna prepare that raw event data in some way. We're gonna take the likes and maybe combine it with 
the watch time of videos and all sorts of other metrics based on a channel or an account. With that, we have this featureized data. So let's imagine a single row that corresponds to Jonathan's channel. This is all the features in a numeric sense that represent my channel. And we're gonna go through that pipeline that I just showed before where we split it into a training set and a test set. We're evaluating it, we're training or updating our model. Let's say it's a recommendation model. And then once that whole cycle and kind of iterative cycle finishes, we're then gonna give a prediction or a score or a recommendation to some end user, whether that's a new user, whether that's me coming back to my channel. And for this whole kind of machine learning training process, sometimes you hear it referred to as a scoring server, and this often exists as its own kind of offline batch service. So maybe the machines or the cluster you're doing your machine learning model training on is actually different than the machines where your web application lives. And kind of a third thing that depending on how big or complex an application might be is something that often is referred to as a machine learning service. So the difference between the scoring server and the machine learning service is that the machine learning service, I often like to think of it almost as just the API to the model. So if you're using a machine learning API from some kind of cloud provider like Google Prediction API or an Amazon API, they have this service that you basically pass in your data and it gives you a prediction back. And all the prediction stuff is abstracted away from you. So that's really the role of the service. It's this extra middleware layer that lives between the application that generates raw data from the actual machine learning model training and evaluating process, which lives on the scoring server. And with the scoring server, let's imagine that this thing's either continuously training, maybe every night it updates its training, it updates the model, Maybe we have something a little bit more complicated where we keep a history of all the models. So let's imagine some model gets retrained on new data. We're doing some evaluation. If the new model performs better than the old model, maybe that's the one we put in production. So again, we have this switching of models and this is really where the machine learning service starts to shine. So you can imagine you have this whole catalog of different models as they're training over time. They have different kind of attributes and performance characteristics. Maybe at a certain time, you really wanna optimize something like if you're YouTube watch time. So you have your watch time recommendation model, but maybe after a certain amount of time or maybe for a certain event, you wanna optimize something like likes or just views. So you could have a bunch of different models and the machine learning service really allows you to switch which model you're basically serving to your application without needing to change everything in your web application or without needing to change everything in the pipeline of how your model trains. And again, this is the secret sauce, the magic of RayServe that again, doesn't really exist at the abstraction that RayServe gives us in any other framework. So there are frameworks like Django and Flask and other web application frameworks, but they're a little lower level than RayServe. If you're building an application, you need fine-grained control of what you do to web requests as they come in. Those web frameworks are, are better suited. If you're doing something like CRUD updates, where you're creating, reading, updating, deleting data in a database, web frameworks are better. But if all you're really doing is serving a machine learning model or really serving any API. RayServe is really tailored built to this and it's built to it in a very scalable fault tolerant way. So let's see what the RayServe API actually looks like and, and what it gives us. So RayServe is really just a nice framework built on top of Ray. So with all the Ray APIs or all the modules built on top of Ray core, you typically need a Ray cluster running um, regardless. So here we can just do Ray in it with the default. So with Ray serve, the kind of simplest, most straightforward approach is to define a function and you almost think of this as a Ray task. And as input, it takes a request or a web request that you're then going to do something with and return some result. In this case, just to kind of show you how this works, we're going to just return a string hello instead of an actual prediction, but we'll see in just a second 
what we're actually going to do in this predict function is load up a machine learning model, take some input data and give a real prediction back. So now that we have the Ray cluster started with Ray in it, and we also have a function defined, in this case, just our predict function, we're going to need to essentially start the serve framework which should feel similar to starting something like a web server. And this is where RayServe, at least its programming interface, diverges a little bit. In RayServe, you have these two abstractions. One's a backend and the other is an endpoint. So in this case, if we call client.create backend, this is essentially going to register or define a new method that the server is going to be serving up. In this case, we give it a name. Let's just say this is our model and the function we pass here, predict, is what's going to get called when this backend triggers. And in addition to having this backend, we're going to create an endpoint. So we give it a name for what we want to call the endpoint. And we also tell it what backend we want to use. And this is really just one other layer in between specifying an endpoint or URL and the function to actually call for that endpoint. And the last argument that's kind of the core of this endpoint argument is defining what HTTP path, in this case, slash predict is going to trigger. So the way you think of this is whenever this route gets hit by an HTTP request, the backend, whatever that backend may be, is then triggered in this case, our predict function, Ray is going to run this on a Ray cluster and whatever our predict returns, we're going to then pass it back to whoever made the request. So now if we actually make a request to localhost on port 8000 at the path predict, we can see here we get returned a response with status code 200, which means it was successful. And here, if we look at the contents of the response res.txt we can see it gives us the string hello so now i want to actually go through what a real machine learning api would actually look like in this RayServe architecture or framework for this machine learning api we're actually going to use a class instead of just using a function since it's going to be a little bit more complex how we need to return a prediction in this case we're going to be using a pre-trained logistic regression model. And I have a link to the file in the code that actually trained this model down in the description. But for this case, we're just serving machine learning prediction. So I'm not gonna go through all the training code itself. The class interface here lets us define an init function, which is going to get called when this model gets initialized. And then to just give predictions, we have a separate function that can just read from this serialized model. So in this case, the model we actually have is a logistic regression model, and this has been trained on a bunch of Stack Exchange posts. We need a way to convert the raw text of the post or the words into a numerical representation for our model. And in this case, we already serialized a TF-IDF vectorizer from Scikit-Learn again. So here, all we do is we load up these model and TF-IDF vectorizers and attach them to this logistic regression class or, or object here. So if you're not familiar with it in, in Python, in Python 3, this tells the function that we're running this as an async function. So one of the really nice things about RayServe is that it comes with this built-in web framework that runs asynchronously, similar to something like Node.js. And using this async framework, we have a keyword called await, which essentially is going to say, do this thing, in this case, read the JSON from this request. And whenever this function returns, store that response in this variable. So even though this happens asynchronously under the covers, this is just syntactic sugar in, in Python that makes us able to write this code in a kind of sequential linear fashion even though these things are running asynchronously in the background. And in this example, the request is just going to have a post parameter, in this case, just the text of a new, let's say, Stack Exchange post. And first, we're going to need to convert this raw text into a TF-IDF vector. And we do that with the vectorizer that we loaded in init. So in this case, we can just call self.vectorizer.transform with the text of the post. And since we're guaranteed that init is always going to already have been run before call gets run, we know that both self.vectorizer and self.clf 
already exist, so we can just trust and, and call them. And once we have our features, we're just going to give a prediction, in this case, classifier.predict. And the last bit is just to return the prediction. In this case, we're returning JSON with both the original post as well as the prediction for that post, just so we have a little bit more context on what prediction refers to which post. And that's really all we need for this Ray API. And now that we have this class, we can do the same things that we just saw. We call client.create backend. In this case, we're calling it log reg for logistic regression. And instead of passing the function definition like we did before, we're actually just passing the class, the log reg model itself. And the create endpoint actually looks identical. So even if we might change what the actual backend, let's say, refers to, in this case, logistic regression model two, we're not going to necessarily need to change the endpoint as long as the backend still has the same name. And again, when you're actually doing this in practice, there is different better things we're going to want to do. But this is just one example of that separation of backend and endpoint. And the other thing that I'm not going to cover in this video is that we can actually reroute traffic differently. So we have a single backend, but we can intelligently route the traffic if we're doing something like an A-B test or some other experimentation outside of the actual model itself. And to actually test our RayServe API, I'm using a program for load testing or stress testing called Locust, which is essentially just going to make a ton of web requests to whatever we specify. And we specify that in a Python file, similar to how we defined our RayServe API. The really nice thing about Locust, in addition to just automating a lot of these requests, is that it gives us a dashboard and it monitors the response time and kind of the load itself. So to start, we can say, we want 10 users, we wanna spawn two users per second, and the host in this case is just going to be where our Ray serve is running, in this case on localhost, port 8000. And the actual path in all of that is specified in a Python file that we define when we are using Locust, but I won't go into that here. I'll link to the code so you can see what actually gets run when we are doing this test. We hit start swarming, we can see we're up to 10 users now. There is 35, this RPS is requests per second. We have zero failures. So this is just making a constant stream of these requests over and over again. And if we look to our Ray dashboard, and we can see here that even when we're making, in this case, around 60 requests per second to this machine learning API, we're only using about 15% of the CPU of our cluster, and we're only using 20% of our RAM, not even two gigabytes. So this both goes to show you kind of the advantage of Ray and Ray serve and how it can be efficient in how it actually runs this process. But also in the fact that if you define your machine learning API correctly, you can architect your API or your server code in a way that makes it much more efficient specifically for machine learning. So if we hit stop, it stops the test. The nice thing again about Locus, we get these nice charts. So here, this red line is the number of failures. There were no failures. The request per second, it ramps up two new users a second until it kind of tops out at around 60 requests per second. But that's only because we specified only 10 users. So hopefully that gives you a really nice introduction to both the really simple API of RayServe. You really only have these four lines of Ray specific code, really only three, you start the server and you only need these two functions to call, you need to define a function or a class to actually define the logic you want to run. But with just this simply defined, you can run Ray serve, you can deploy this in the cloud on a cluster on AWS or Google Compute Cloud, Ray actually has built in cluster deployment scripts. So all of this is really going to make it as effortless, but as performant as possible to deploy these machine learning models. This more infrastructure, DevOps, the productionization side of machine learning, it's kind of something where it's just this hidden industry knowledge of, all right, we've trained a model, we've done all these things, now we need to deploy it. But most of the kind of machine learning tutorials out there really focus on what's in the grand scheme of things, a very small portion of the machine learning process of the training a model and validating a model. So this is just kind of a small piece 
and the larger process of productionizing machine learning at scale for a real service or, or company. And no one really talks about the other 80 to 90% of what you need to do. So this is what I hope this video kind of fills in the gaps of what's all the other nebulous things that you need to do in practice with machine learning that no one else is really talking about.